Okay, welcome everyone. And thanks for joining us for today's conversation, part of AgeWell's public webinar series. I see that uh, the numbers of participants rolling in has slowed. So I think that we can get going. Just rearranging screens here. Uh, my name is Bridget Murphy, everyone. I am the Managing Director and COO of AgeWell. And today we will be exploring the latest census data from Statistics Canada and talking about their implications for uh, the age tech sector and from an age tech perspective. I wanna let you know that we are recording the conversation today and we will be posting it to AgeWell's YouTube channel in the coming days. So don't worry about taking notes. I know you're gonna see uh, a number of uh, stats and figures today, uh, but you'll be able to revisit um, the presentation or share it with a friend in the days to come. Now, uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that although we are meeting virtually today, we operate on the traditional territories of many indigenous nations, which have cared for the land for thousands of years, including the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. And I recognize the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This land remains home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people and is subject to the dish with one spoon wampum, which is a treaty, uh, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. I'm grateful for the opportunity to work on this land today you may live and work in different territories, and so we encourage you to reflect on the land on which you are located and to consider your relationship to the land and the people who are the traditional keepers of that land. And I'll just invite you to do that now for a moment. So I'm gonna pull up some slides now. Um, before we get uh, into our session today, before we launch in, I want to tell you a little bit about AgeWell for anyone joining us today who does not know us. And I'm also going to share some information about how to participate in today's discussion via the chat box before we hear presentations from our speakers. So about AgeWell, we are Canada's technology and aging network. We were launched in 2015 with funding from the Federal Networks of Centers of Excellence program, and we are now in year eight of operation. Our vision is that Canada's leadership in technology and aging, um, we, we often call that now age tech, the age tech sector, uh, benefits the world. So leadership in technology and aging benefits the world. Our mission is to develop a community of researchers, older adults, caregivers, partners, uh, future leaders in the sector to accelerate the development of technology-based solutions that will make a meaningful difference in the lives of Canadians. And um, I'll just highlight the word community there because AgeWell creates space to bring together many uh, points of view across research disciplines, across sectors. So think industry, community services, academia, and more. And we, 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 we seek to bring in these diverse perspectives in everything that we do. Um, of course, we're, we're also always very interested in hearing about who's joining us. So do feel free to let us know where you're from, what region or what sector in the chat, if you feel like sharing with us. Next slide, please. So in keeping with the theme of today's discussion, I wanna share with you some stats about AgeWell that you see on this slide. Uh, we've grown to be quite large in our eight years of operation and now include 250 researchers at 47 universities and research centers across Canada. More than 1,200 trainees or HQP, highly qualified personnel have participated in our training programs. And we're now supporting more than 60 Canadian age tech startups. And you'll see this 170 solutions number there. That's 170 technology services, policies and practices that have been developed with AgeWell support over our eight years. We've also launched four national innovation hubs um, in the last four years or so. And these hubs focus on policy, such as our APTA hub based in Fredericton, New Brunswick, sensors and analytics for memory and mobility at SAM3 based in Ottawa, 
digital health solutions uh, from Circle Innovation based in Surrey and Vancouver in BC, uh, as well as technology adoption in rural and remote settings from our newest hub, CTAN, uh, based in Prince George, also in BC. But I think importantly, um, the, the, the number on this slide to really pay attention to is that 5,000 plus, that's 5,000 plus older adults and caregivers who are engaged in network activities, everything from participating in governance committees to advising research projects to providing uh, feedback to our startups. And I know a number of uh, these participants in the network will be joining us today. So I'll stop there with respect to uh, an overview of the network. And with that, I'd like you to meet our two speakers today. So can we see everyone on screen for a moment? So Paul, I'd like you to go first, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about what you're planning to share with us today. Sure, thank you very much, Bridget. Thank you very much for, for having me. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Paul Laffin. I'm a data ambassador here at the Toronto Data Service Center of Statistics Canada. And one of my primary responsibilities is to manage our engagement with the community. In other words, I work with all types of groups such as AgeWell um, to ensure that the Canadian public is aware of the data that, that are available and how it could help with the work that they do. So this is, this is great. This really helps me with, uh, with the work that I do. And, and so thank you for having me and thank you for the work that you do. And I think you'll see in the presentation how it's gonna become more important um, in the coming years. Great, thanks so much, Paul. And Josephine, some of us know you very well, but can you also introduce yourself and tell us what you'll be talking about today? Oh, mute. Hi, Bridget. It's great to be here, and um, I'm really eager to, to have this discussion today. Um, I am an associate professor at the Lazarita School of Business and Economics in the Business Technology Management Program at Wilfrid Laurier University, but I'm also very delighted to have recently been appointed as one of two um, associate scientific directors at HWell. Um, just to buy the by, I, I'm also a, an HWell researcher um, and have been in the past and so have uh, lots of experience working with HWell and, and knowing the incredible practical growth that it's been able to bring to research and applied uh, and applied uh, research in, in Canada with respect to age tech. So thank you for having me here. And I'm hoping that I can bring my kind of weird PhD in health studies and gerontology and background in business and MBA to bring a different kind of perspective to the uh, StatsCan data. Great, thanks so much. And you know, Josephine, right off the top, we said that uh, AgeWell is a place for a diverse perspective. So you're the very embodiment of that. But thanks to both of you for um, being with us today. We're gonna get going in a second, um, but for our audience, we're going to be sharing a lot of information with you today. So if you have questions, and we hope that you do, we're gonna be having a question period in the second half of our session today. Um, following our presentations from Paul and Josephine, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can in that period. So allow us that you please input your questions into the chat function in Zoom. Uh, Nicole uh, from the Network Management Office is here uh, behind the scenes. She'll be helping me to moderate questions in the chat, and she can also answer technical questions that you may have if you have any. So feel free to reach out via the chat um, and you can find Nicole in particular under the age well name, but otherwise feel free to pose your questions to everyone. Um, now, for those of you who don't see the chat box, and I know that some of you do already, uh, I just want to highlight that you can bring that box up by clicking on the icon shaped like a speech bubble that you can normally find at the bottom um, of your Zoom window. And depending on your device, you may need to click on the three dots to bring that bubble option up or grab the corner of your uh, screen, um, expand it to make that option appear. So I'll just give you a couple of seconds, everyone, to get that ready. Um, and then we will turn things over to our first speaker. So Paul, we'd like to begin with you. 
Uh, could you tell us about the new data that's come out recently from Statistics Canada? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen. Um, and I think you should be able to see my opening slide now. Yep. Looks per good. Perfect. Thank you very much. And first off, I want to I, I thank I've already thanked Agewell. You know, amazing work that you do, and this is a great opportunity for me. To, um, but also thank you to everyone uh, in the meeting today uh, for most importantly completing your census. We got an incredible response rate despite uh, all the challenges. So so thank you very much, and thank you also if you've ever had the opportunity to. to uh, to take part in any one of our other surveys. We have over 400 different statistical programs. So thank you. Um, our work is not possible without, uh, without respondents. So, um, but yeah, so I would just want to start by providing you with a picture of our release schedule for the 2021 census. We started releasing the data in February of this year with the basic population and dwelling count data. Uh, more recently, we've uh, released uh, on July 13th, we released data on families, uh, military experience, and income. Uh, by the end of November of this year, we would have completed all of our major releases, which will be, which then will include the data on education, labor, commuting, and some additional uh, language data as well. Today, though, we're going to primarily focus on on a, the age data and the data surrounding house, on households. So let's start with the uh, specifically on age. At the very basic level, you can look at the median age of the population, meaning half the population is above and the other half is below this age. Um, this shows that in 2021, there was an increase as it compared to the 2016 census. But I think it may be more valuable to look at it another way. Here on this uh, infographic, you can see you, we, we're taking a look at the proportion of the population that is 65 and older. It shows that while the population population is aging everywhere in Canada, it's just not aging at the same pace. So from 2016, the last, the previous census period to 2021, the proportion of the population aged 65 and older grew the fastest in Newfoundland and Labrador at uh, plus 4.2 percentage points. While in none of it, it increased by only 0.6 percentage points. Another way to look at it is by looking at the age structure of the Canadian population using an age pyramid. The purple line that you see here, it represents the population in 2021, the men on the left and the women on the right. In green, um, the solid color is the age pyramid of 1970, 1971 after the baby boom. It's interesting to see that on the 2021 pyramid that these baby boomers still represent the largest generation nationally. The baby boomers are now between the ages of 56 and 75 years old. Where we look at another subset of the population, those uh, 85 years and over, which you see here on the slide, we can see that this population continues to grow from where this data started on this slide in 1966, going up to the data from the most recent census in 2021. The bars in the lighter shade of blue on the right, those represent the projection, which indicate that this subset is expected to continue to grow. And we'll touch more on this population group a little bit later on in the presentation. Here on this graph, we're looking at two different age groups. In red, you will find those 55 to 64, an age at which many Canadians are about to leave the workforce or thinking about it at least. In blue are those who are between 15 and 24. That record gap indicator that you see on the, on the graph are, shows that there are more persons aged 55 to 64 than young adults aged 15 to 24. And that age group is significant because those, that's the age at which individuals, individuals typically enter the labor force. In 2021, there were 81 persons aged 15 to 24 per 100 persons aged 55 to 64. In contrast to that, in 1966, this ratio was different with more than 200 person aged uh, 15 to 24 per 100 person aged 55 to 64. 
But over the next decade, persons aged 55 to 64 are expected to carry less demographic weight within the working age population. And this is because the last cohort of the large baby boom generation will have turned 65 by 2030. And they'll, replace, they'll be replaced by individuals from the smaller Generation X. And as a result, the number of people nearing retirement is expected to decline over the coming years. So now let's take a look at data related to the composition of households in Canada. The data from the, from the latest census shows that there was a record high share of one person households. Um, but further analysis shows that this ranks fairly low among our G7 peers, close to, close to the bottom of that list, and uh, much lower than some of those other countries that you see um, on the right-hand side uh, of, the, uh, of that infographic. The census will also provide us with data on what type of homes that we live in. For example, 56% of one-person households lived in apartments, while 61% of households with two or more people in them lived in a single detached house. Just a couple more notes about solo living. It's, it's on the rise among younger adults and it's declining among older women. So the prevalence of living alone has always been highest at the older ages and this remained the case in 2021. Solo dwellers represented 42% of all, of, of all people aged 85 and older in private households, compared with 7% of people um, aged 20 to 24. Nonetheless, living alone has become less prevalent among older women in recent decades. And this was a living situation of 53% of women aged 85 and older in private households in 2021. And this compares with 60% in 2001. So the gradual convergence in life expectancies of men and women since the 80s has allowed for more people, particularly women, to keep living as part of a couple at older ages. So receiving care and support from a spouse or partner at home could allow more older adults to age in place in their homes um, if that is something they, they want to continue. In contrast, the prevalence of living alone has, has increased over time at younger ages, particularly in the middle adulthood. For example, the share of people aged 35 to 44 living alone has doubled from 81 to 2021. And this trend may reflect the members of Gen X and millennials who made up this age group in 2021, the things like postponing family formation until they finished school and found stable jobs, other societal shifts such as growing relationship instability, the rise of non-cohabitating relationship, urbanization, changing lifestyle preferences, and also the growth of high-rise apartments offering single-person dwellings have also contributed to the rise in living alone among younger adults. So although the majority of people aged 85 and older are still women, the census shows that the number of men in that age group is increasing at a faster pace. In 2021, there were 1.7 women for every man aged 85 and older compared with 1.9 persons who are female for every male in 2016. This is because of, again, a stronger increase since in the end of the 70s in life expectancy for men, meaning that the gap between the number of men and the number of women in this age group is shrinking. So census data is also, census data also allows us to look at the different types of households, including those that contain grandparents and grandchildren. Almost one in 10 children living in the same, um, one in 10 children were living in the same household of at least one of their grandparents. And we could break this down further. Of those kids living with grandparents, 63% of them are living with two, two parents plus at least one grandparent. 30% lived with one parent only and at least one grandparent and 7% and, and lived with at least one of their grandparents but neither parent. So now let's take a look at couples specifically. I just wanted to quickly point out a couple of things. First, on this slide here, uh, you'll see that as, the case, as has been the case for the last 100 years, most of the population aged 15 and over is married or living common law. In fact, if you look more closely to where the graph starts and where it ends, uh, where it is now, we're almost at the same place in that 55 to 60% range.
we have noticed that the proportion of couples, couple families that have children at home has been decreasing and that's due to uh, the, the aging of the population that we mentioned and also with regards to decreased fertility. So the, uh, the number of children that uh, people um, have been having in the last uh, few decades. Now we're gonna take a look at collective dwellings. So those are things like uh, lodging or rooming houses, hotels, motels, tourist establishments, nursing homes, residence for senior citizens, hospitals, staff residents, military bases, work camps, correctional facilities, and group homes. Those are what we refer to as collective dwellings. So 20% of the population aged 85 years and older live in some form of a collective. And the, ne the next slide will provide more detail on the types of, of, of collective dwellings. So as the population of 85 and over ages, they're less likely to live in a residence for seniors and more likely to live in a nursing home. So among Canadians aged 85 and older living in a collective dwelling, the proportion of those living in a nursing care facility increases from 40% for people aged 85 to 89 to almost 60% for uh, centenarians. One reason for this is, uh, is obvious is a demand for health care and access to the types of specialized care provided by seniors, residents, and nursing care facilities. Uh, there are now over 100,000 people age 85 and up living in nursing care facilities in Canada. Last but not least, I wanted to point out that, uh, as I touched upon earlier, that the census collected data on Canadian military experience, and this is the first time it's done so in 50 years. This data will provide an insight into the demographic characteristics like the income and gender of those currently serving, as well as uh, veterans of the uh, Canadian military. Finally, uh, this slide simply tells you a bit more about the work that my department does. And you'll see that there's a telephone number and an email address at the bottom of the screen. Um, more simply, if, if you are ever having difficulty finding something on our website, what I tell everyone is, is don't, don't get frustrated. It's a lot. Like I said, it's over 400 different surveys um, and uh, statistical programs. At the bottom of each of, the, each of our websites is a contact, contact us link where you can reach someone by email, phone, live chat. Um, I think we even actually have a, a fax service as well. So, so please do reach out to us if you do have any questions that don't get answered today or if in the future that uh, you're wondering about something with, with regards to uh, St Statistics Canada. Great. Thanks so much, Paul. You know, at AgeWell, we, we often talk about how our aging population is both um, you know, one of the greatest achievements, but also one of the biggest challenges that we are facing collectively. Um, so I think to, to, to speak a bit more about this and put some of it in context, we'll hear from our second speaker now, Dr. Josephine McMurray, who will talk about the age tech context um, of what we've heard from Paul. Awesome. Thanks so much, Bridget. And, and first off, I, I just want to preface my remarks by saying that while I am a researcher in the age tech space, and, and I work as an advocate in my role um, in AgeWell, that there's actually no better way to understand a phenomenon than living through it yourself. And as a care partner for my now 97-year-old mother-in-law who uh, lives with mild cognitive impairment and, and who struggled to live independently over the past year, I, I know intimately the challenges of finding practical technical solutions that can respect the functional and cultural preferences of, of older adults. So I, I understand. And so while I'm going to be talking in a very positive light today about technology, I want to uh, just sort of reach out and empathize with everybody who is trying to sort their way through the, uh, the milieu. Uh, so um, first off, I should probably share my screen that would help right there. And um, so I'm going to be um, uh, just moving through a, a number of slides in uh, in response to what I was thinking about um, as I went through um, and listened to Paul's uh, slide deck and, and read it prior to this, uh, to, uh, prior to today. Um, but perhaps before I talk about technology and aging at age well, we should step back and think about some of that 
that future implication of that StatsCan data that we just saw. So in poll slide number seven about the tripling of the number of Canadians over 85 by 2051, that to me was really thought provoking. I mean, even before then, by 2035, Canada will be considered a super aged country where one in four Canadians will be older than 65 years old. So as, as Bridget has pointed out, we at AGWL like to say, you know, greatest achievement of science, education and social development, but also one of our biggest challenges challenges as a nation going forward. As Paul points out on slide number eight, the number of people exiting the workforce will out, uh, outpace those who are entering, uh, entering the workforce. And this in concert with these challenges is something that's going to be really important. It's going to have big consequences for us. So for instance, it will impact our ability to fund social programs from taxation of income, or our ability to afford and deliver essential services to what will be an increasingly vulnerable population, but with a relatively smaller workforce to do so. This also has, or the statistics also have important consequences on publicly funded healthcare expenditures. Canadians over 65 accounted for around 46% of total healthcare expenditures in 2019. Um, and given the StatsCan population aging projections, if nothing changes, individuals aged 65 and older will account for more than 71% of total healthcare expenditures by 2040. This is a big deal. And even if you're healthy, according to an RBC survey, the annual out-of-pocket healthcare expenses for someone over 65 are about $5,700, almost double what most people think they're going to have to spend. So being able to sustain employment that accommodates older adults in the workforce after what is a typical retirement age of say 65 may be crucial to the financial health of some Canadians and their ability to live well. So in sum, without immediate and sustained interventions that empower Canadians to work, live and age with dignity and autonomy in the place of their choice, this demographic shift that Paul's data pretends will pose unprecedented challenges to Canadians. We'll need to develop innovative responses to these changes if we want to sustain and, and better yet to improve our quality of life as we age. So this is where AgeWell and its researchers and other stakeholders have been making a difference as a network since 2015. Um, but we've had to take a measured approach uh, so that we can ensure we have impact on the most pressing priorities. So in 2018, AgeWell conducted a comprehensive review of policy priorities related to older adults across governments in Canada and internationally. And these priorities were validated with input from researchers, government, nonprofit, and industry stakeholders, and stakeholders, and true to uh, the age well way, uh, with uh, many older adults and caregivers themselves. And we came up with a short list of 18 challenge areas that was presented at public consultations again uh, across Canada. And so we had input from over a thousand stakeholders to those short lists. What came out of that process is a set of eight. Uh, high priority challenge areas where technology is having and will have major impact on the lives of aging Canadians. And these challenge areas are, I think, validated and impacted by each of those shifting demographics that Paul's uh, data highlighted today. Um, perhaps this is a good time for us to step back and, and just quickly say what we mean by age tech, because I know Bridget was using it and I've used it a couple of times. Generally, it refers to digital interventions that help to improve the lives of older adults. And increasingly, it's used to refer to an industry sector, kind of a vertical that intersects what's called the longevity sector. And this is a $14.5 trillion market for goods and services purchased by and for aging adults globally. Um, and this is increasingly opening up technological solutions that are expected to grow that potential market to over 27 trillion by 2050. So it's really important for us to be able to recognize that there is this 
this this construct, this age tech sector and this age tech concept that we need to think about as a potential innovative way of addressing some of those challenges that I talked about on previous slides. But we need to be careful about how we think about technology and the sector, as there are many stakeholders. Um, there are older adults themselves who are purchasing technology, and they may be early adopters, or they could be highly sophisticated users. At one of our hackathons, I met an engineer who was in his 80s, and he was an incredibly successful and uh, technology user. His wife, however, was very, very different and, and, and had hardly any um, uh, um, exposure. There are also individuals and institutions who are purchasing technology to care for or deliver services to older adults um, who might be in their sphere or in their care. It might also be younger family or friends who are purchasing or influencing the purchase or adoption of many of those previous users. And of course, we have to be prepared for and to think about future users because they may be more digitally savvy than those folks who are in this, uh, this, this cohort now, but they will have to navigate increasingly more complex and more busy technology options. Um, and just in case you're skeptical, and perhaps just by the fact that you're here today, you're not, but uh, about whether older adults themselves are technologically ready, an age well environics poll um, of, a, of over 2,000 Canadians over the age of 55 showed that um, over 76% of them self-report being quite confident with the technology, and a majority of them are willing to pay out of pocket for it in order to be able to improve the, um, the, their lives. So this is a natural segue, I think, into the age tech commercialization and implementation pipeline that is being nurtured through AgeWell. And this is a very tiny slide and, and you, you won't necessarily see it, but as, H, as Bridget pointed out, um, AgeWell is leading where other industry players have been afraid to tread. Um, this is our pipeline by challenge area of those technologies that she, uh, that she mentioned. But I, I do want to point out missing from this list um, uh, uh, that AgeWell supports and funds our foundational and early research projects that may eventually result in or contribute to the development of, of um, technologies and, and age tech innovations. Um, and, and they may well be part of that future that we're talking about as well. So very, very broad. And um, certainly um, there are other descriptors of age tech te uh, technologies the, um, beyond the age well sphere that are out there. In my final comments, I, I'd like to just highlight some AGL supported technologies that are being validated and implemented across various living and working circumstances to benefit the older Canadians that Paul was talking about in these new circumstances. Uh, the first one is Vital Tracer that allows for constant and continuous monitoring of all vital signs using a medical grade smartwatch um, and a software plot platform. So allows people to uh, live actively, but to still be monitored. We also have Braze Mobility, um, an amazing uh, uh, technology and company that uses blind spot sensors that can be added to any wheelchair that transforms it into a smart wheelchair that can navigate objects independently. And then Teneracare, which is a platform that uses sensors to monitor residents and sometimes staff and perhaps visitors if it's installed in a care setting as they move around. So it can give notifications if someone needs assistance and can also be used for contact tracing. Some other of our wonderful uh, technologies that are coming through are, are a technology like uh, Virtual Gym, um, which is an exercise platform for health practitioners to provide game-like exercise for older adults. And it has individualized configurations to match with their capabilities and their preferences. Things like archery and slide sabers get them, um, uh, slide sabers get them uh, uh, active. And we also have Rosa, which is a robotic car. So for people who are struggling to move uh, things up and down stairs in their uh, their current uh, home, they can actually put the use rope in it to automatically shuttle things up between floors instead of uh, having to do it themselves. And then finally, the Alta device, uh, which is developed by Able Innovations that allows a single care provider to transfer someone to and from bed 
obviously an innovation which is critical in long-term care when many older adults uh, struggle with mobility issues. So um, these are just a few examples of how the aged tech sector is developing in anticipation of and in response to uh, these changing uh, 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 population demographics that Paul was talking about. I, I do want to point out um, that the pipeline for aged tech products really needs to be bigger, and I think we can all agree on that having seen his presentation. The only way to do that is to encourage government investment and research and support of policies uh, like subsidizing internet access in rural and remote areas so that we have equitable access to some of these solutions, um, as well um, to support and grow this emerging age tech industry. We need to remove barriers to expansion and the development of high quality innovations and technology solutions. So while we don't know with certainty what age tech innovations will emerge or dominate in the future, we know that there is no doubt what However, that they will profoundly change the way that we individually and um, as, as in our institutions um, live, work and receive care. So with that, I'll hand it back to Bridget to start the discussion and um, I look forward to any questions or insights that you might have. Okay, thanks so much, Josephine. And uh, we've got a whole lot here to think about. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that I think in the first few minutes of this session, the chat might not have been accessible to everyone. So I'll just uh, let you know that it looks like it's working now. We're seeing questions coming in. And if you had a very early question and weren't able to get it in um, in, in the uh, uh, beginning of the presentations, please take a second look. Looks like everything is OK now. Um, okay, so let's dig in with some questions, and we've got uh, a, a number here um, coming in from participants, and I'll attempt to uh, get them in order, and the first one uh, certainly is for you, Paul, from Jim Razzo, and Jim is saying, it was my understanding that the number of people living alone, no family, no friends, was increasing. I take from your presentation that this is not necessarily so with men's aging coming to match women's. Uh, any comments? Yeah, it's um, it, de it definitely is continuing that trend. Um, it's a long term pattern of growth. Um, it's I'm just look, I, I saw the note ahead of time, so I did a little bit of research. Um, it's it's been since uh, it's in 1981. It was 1.7 million people lived alone. Um, and uh, in 2021, it was 4.4 million people that lived alone. Um, what, what, is, what is changing are, are some of the people that live alone at some of the older age groups, as I mentioned, as, as, men, um, as men live longer, um, and as, a, as that difference narrows, that you'll, you'll see um, more men um, and, and men and women living as a couple a little bit longer, um, resulting in fewer women living alone. Um, and then the, the phenomenon that I mentioned with younger people uh, living alone a little bit longer as well. So I hope okay. that answers the question. Great, thank you. Um, so we, we do have a couple more for you, uh, Paul, and, but I'm going to pose one to Josephine now, just to balance things out a little. Um, and Josephine, we have, a, we have a question I'd like you to take from Anne-Marie, and that is uh, about the implications of these data for the age tech sector. Great, thank you so much for that, that, that question. And um, I, I think that, um, really what we have to do is we have to in, uh, support increasing awareness um, that there needs to be and is now um, and will be increasingly in the future a robust market for age tag. Um, and uh, there are uh, there are companies that are coming through uh, through the support of AgeWell, but many other established uh, vendors who are need to be encouraged um, into the market, 
and need to be given um, support in both understanding the market and helping to disseminate the information about available technologies that can be developed and, and commercialized um, to improve the quality of life of older adults. And that is no easy task. Um, I think it will require some creativity and some collaborations between researchers and industry to ensure that older adults get access to and learn about um, uh, new technologies that can help them in real time. So we need validation studies, we need implementation studies that identifies those technologies that are most useful to support people in the varying situations that they are going to find themselves as they age, either in institutions or in their own home. And thanks for the question, Emery. Great, thank you. Um, so next I'm going to go to a question from Mark, uh, and this is for you, Paul. Were there any stats that say what percentage of 65 plus are working and what kind of work are they doing? That's a, that's a, a great question. And it's something that, uh, that I remember from the last uh, census release that uh, speaking about, because the, the data from the last census showed that um, people were, 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 were working a little bit longer. As we live longer, we were able to, and then many people choose to uh, work a little bit longer. Um, the data for on labor related to labor has not yet been released for, from the census. Uh, that's one of those uh, data points that'll be released in on November 30th of this year. Um, but I could tell you from one of our other um, one of our, from the labor force survey. So every month we release data on unemployment rate and things like that, that comes from our labor force survey. And so for that, we do have some data, of course, and uh, we have some annual averages. And I, I took a look at uh, one table here and it shows that, uh, that yeah, there, there is a trend for people working, um, you know, a little bit later is the average retirement age in 2021 was uh, 64.5. Um, and if you rewind five years before that was 63.2 in 2016. So there is that increase and we'll have to wait to see um, what the census data will show because that's a much broader scope and, and uh, it will be an interesting picture because of, uh, especially with the pandemic, um, you, could, you hear all these stories about, you know, if people are, are retiring earlier or if they're prolonging working because, because there's a lot of opportunities for people to work from home. So that'll be interesting, but unfortunately, we'll have to wait until, uh, until November for that uh, big picture. Great, thanks. And um, a comment and, and question here from, from John Hamblin. He's saying uh, on, on this theme, we're short workers, but we continue to put 65 as the retirement age. Why don't we stop saying this and encourage over 65 to continue working and companies to employ them? We're living 25 plus years longer and need to expand the work years. What are we going to do about this as a country? Which, um, Paul, I won't, I won't necessarily put that <laughs> last question to you, but you know, I'll maybe open it up um, to everyone on this chat because I know uh, that a lot of us are, are, are thinking about this um, very issue and we're seeing other participants um, uh, of the webinar today also sort of chiming in in support of that notion. Um, uh, we're seeing with the longevity revolution, I'm hearing about the 60 year career and five generation workforces. And I think that this is a really critical area of activity that we need to think about, not just about what can we contribute to this, but you know, so much of this is actually about how do we support, um, how do we support our government? How do we support policies to change and adjust to the reality of what we are uh, what we are actually seeing borne out in the numbers like what you're sharing today, Paul. Yeah, there's a there's a number and I'm definitely not an expert in this area, this area, but there's a there is a number called uh, referred to as a dependency ratio. Um, and that's looking at the people in the workforce compared to the people who are not in the workforce who who do depend on on the, you know things for you know production of goods a simple thing as well as you know uh, tax revenues um, but yeah but yeah so no definitely there there is there was that trend in 16 in 2016 that showed that people were working past 65 and there were, and that 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 group was increasing in size so we'll have to see what it shows in the, in the, in November. 
Bridget, if I can just yeah. chime in here, because I think this is a super important issue. Um, there are lots of things which prevent people from working beyond that date. Some of them are structural, things like, you know, at one point, and this did actually, it was actually challenged in court, um, people were unable to get and retain disability insurance past a, a, a certain age. Um, it, it, as well, you know, there is sort of structural ageism in the workforce. And how that plays out is people tend to be sidelined after the age of 50. So they don't get the kind of opportunities for training and um, and, and and access to new and interesting jobs beyond that point because they're seen as being kind of, you know, end of career. The other structural things that we have to think about is, is how we encourage them to stay within the workforce is, you know, things like making it easier for people to work part time. Sometimes you get to a certain age and you don't want to have a full time job. So, you know, having some of these incentives um, so that um, they can both stay on the job, but then also as a government, making sure that our fiscal policy doesn't interfere with that by having disincentives in the retirement income system that, that means that, you know, there's no advantage to people working past a certain age. Or oh, just by the by, too, I think the Conservative government, you know, had a platform where they were going to extend the retirement age um, a number of years ago, and it was um, not a popular, <laughs> not a popular uh, uh, move. So I, I think that's the other thing is we need to be encouraging folks to, um, you know, look carefully at their fiscal situation and how long they think they're going to be living and what kind of, of, uh, of life and quality of life they want to have beyond uh, their retirement years, uh, beyond their working years. Thanks so much for those comments, Josephine. Um, we've got a question here about uh, family caregivers. So Paul, this is for you. And um, from David asking, uh, looking to understand if StatsCan tracks family caregivers. In other words, do you identify households where someone is caring for a loved one, either under the same roof or at a distance, um, paid or unpaid? And if so, how is this segmented from a data collection perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad it was asked and, and I, I should have included and perhaps I, we could share with the group later on, but we do have another um, survey called the General Social Survey and that goes through a cycle and there's different topics every year and they go through a five or 10 year cycle depending on, and one of the cycles is on caregiving. Um, so we do collect that data on, on caregivers, and those are um, asking people who receive care, how they receive it, but also people in households who provide care. So I'm, I'm not referring to the, you know, the formal um, paid for generally or government provided care. I'm talking about the informal um, caregiver in a household, and we do collect that data and we do disseminate. It's not as a, it's a it's a sample survey. It's not as robust as the census, um, so you can't get those you know lower levels of geography. But it does provide a, a great picture of um, from the uh, you know for a province or for the country as a whole. And again, just to re reiterate, it's called the General Social Survey Caregiving. Um, you could find that on our website and please um, if you are interested in more in that please uh, please reach out to contact us on our website and they'll be able to provide you with more detail on that but absolutely that is something that we've been collecting for some time thanks paul um we're we're nearing the time where we're going to have to switch gears here but i want to just um go back to a follow-up question that's uh, actually in the Q&A for you, Paul, and that's coming from Olive. And the question is, this goes back a couple of questions, why has the dependency ratio not changed over the years? That is something I'll have to defer um, to, to, to further research for that person. And, and then provide more information. Unfortunately, that's outside my area of expertise, but I, there, we do have those people um, that would be to, so we'll, we'll, we'll follow up with that one. Okay, great. Sorry about that. No, no, that's great. Um, so I think we've got time for about one last question here. Um, I think we are at Marjorie's question in the chat. 
And Marjorie is asking, um, Marjorie saying, I would think that the evolution of how people work largely precipitated by COVID-19, like the growing flexibility of companies allowing for more flexible or shorter hours, working from home, et cetera, would better support older adults staying in the workforce longer. And I think that, uh, that supports what you were saying, Josephine, as well, with respect to um, really uh, ensuring that there's flexibility in the available options in the in the workforce um, over the age of 65. But you know, to Marjorie's point, I think that the pandemic has obviously really changed the way a lot of us work, um, and that expectations about options in the workforce, maybe even um, uh, independent of age have changed very much and there'll be a lot of change um, following on from that. Um, okay, so I think, uh, I, I know there are a couple of questions that we, we didn't get to, so sorry about that. They are in the chat. We're gonna switch gears here. There's a few things that we want to um, be able to share with you before we wrap up today with respect to um, uh, our upcoming events in the fall. But uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Paul and Josephine so very much for their presentations. For all of you who tuned in today and for the great questions that have been coming uh, through the chat and, and through, other, um, through other messaging platforms, it's been really great to see this, uh, this type of engagement. Of course, it's a very, very important topic and very near and dear to us here at AgeWell. So again, thank you very much to our presenter. So we'll just call up some slides now. So before we wrap, I want to tell you a little bit about the next webinar in this series, Agile's public webinar series, which will be held on September 20th at one o'clock Eastern. September, as many of you will know, is Arthritis Awareness Month. And we'll be exploring some technological solutions designed to support people living with arthritis in that conversation. We'll hear about a device called Guided Hands for individuals with limited hand mobility and a novel technology to help prevent pain. We'll also meet an older adult living with arthritis who will share his insights and experiences. And as always, we hope you will take part and share your thoughts and questions with the panelists in that conversation as well. Finally, don't forget to mark your calendars. Uh, next slide, please, for the AgeWell Annual Conference coming up October 18th to the 20th in Regina, Saskatchewan. This event is for anyone with an interest in technology and aging. We will be showcasing research and innovation from across the country and connecting AgeWell partners, researchers, stakeholders, and members of the public at that event. You can find out more about this event on the AgeWell website, so please do uh, check it out. So that's everything for today. Um, as mentioned, we recorded the session. If you'd like to watch this again or share it with a friend, uh, the recording will be posted to our YouTube channel in the coming days and you can check it out there. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming today and wish you all a great rest of your day.